I didn't take my vitamin C this morning, so uh, I'm going to cut it a little short. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> anyway, I'd like to, uh, to speak a little bit on uh, movement <coughs> versus <coughs> monument. Movement versus monument. You know, all through history, every religious group has had an element of truth. Every group has had an element. If they didn't have a little element of truth, they wouldn't get a following. But it's kind of like rat poison, you know? It is uh, it's full of healthy food, but it's got enough poison in it to kill the mouse or the rat. <clears throat> but anyway, every, every group, every religious group has had some truth. And uh, I was thinking about uh, how the church in the book of Acts, such great things happened and, you know, great healing where, where took place under the, the ministry of the disciples and, and the apostles and all those that followed the Lord. And then as time went on, we get to the end of the book of Revelation, the church started uh, moving backwards and started a little bit at a time. It's kind of like putting a frog in a skillet. You know, he don't know it's getting hot till he's done cooked. But uh, time went on and it, pretty soon the religious people began to give more credence to sticks and statues than they did the power of God. I'm gonna stop right here. Terry, Dr. Yoder, it's good to see you here today. I saw those pictures of your barn back up blew away, didn't it? Last night. So when I seen you pull up, I was like, praise God. <laughs> Most people would have stayed home with that much crisis in their house. Anyway, now I got that off my mind and going. <laughs> anyway, people started giving more credence to sticks and statues than they did to the power of God. And uh, by the time the 1500s come along, there was a monk named Martin Luther, who began to, there was a, a, a seeking of the Lord down on the inside of him that uh, he felt like walking in glass and beating himself and sleeping on the bare concrete and sleeping in the snow to try to get God's attention and God would forgive him of any bad thought he had and, and all of that. And, um, he finally realized there's a revelation. You know, when you seek the Lord, when you have a heart to seek the Lord, He will enlighten you. And He, he began to say, we're saved. How? By grace. By grace. Through something. Through faith. And He ended up writing 95 reasons why he was going to leave the Catholic Church. So the Catholics persecuted him. And he became the persecuted. For 200 years after that, about the 1700s, Charles and John Wesley, they, they began to read Martin Luther's writings and some other things, and they began to say, hey, God began to do something in them and they began to say that it's not just saved by grace, but there, when we acknowledge God, there's a, something on the inside of us that when temptations and tests come, we're able to say no. There's a power within us. And in history, that's taught as sanctification. But the Lutherans, the new Lutherans, persecuted the Methodists, the new Methodists. So now, the Lutherans are the persecutors. The Methodists are now the persecuted. About 200 more years goes by, a little less than 200 years, and some of those Methodist people began to see there's a power in the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And there's more than just being saved or just being sanctified. There's an experience in God that's beyond that. Yes, who's now the persecutors? 
the Methodists are now the persecutors, and the New Pentecostals are the persecuted. And every group that stepped out of the box and began to proclaim something new is always the heretic. They're always the, the persecuted, right? Now, the persecution in that day um, was stiffer than it is today. Now, Dr. Yoder here was raised Mennonite. And uh, the Mennonites come out of the Catholic Church right after Martin Luther. Am I got my history right? But there wasn't too much difference except they didn't believe in baby infant baptism. And here's what the Lutherans <coughs> saw that. They burnt their meeting places down. Just over that, maybe another issue or two. That was some of the main issues. They burnt their meeting places down. So every group that sees a little bit more, they're now the persecuted. They're the heretic. The one behind them is the persecutor. So we get to the early 1900s, late 1800s, the Pentecostals that begin to come out of the Methodist Church, they begin to get persecuted by the holiness movements. And I'll speed up time here a little bit. 1940s, another great movement of God began to spread through the land. It started in, in Detroit, Michigan. And people began to search and seek God and said, there's something in me that tells me there's more. There's something more. Now, I've met and know a good friend of ours who's since passed away just a couple years ago, but he went to that meeting. And he said, they went six solid months and never closed the service. And they just worshiped the Lord. People would take vacations and go there and and they wouldn't even go back to their motels. They'd stay for days and fast. They said it was it was hot and it was the body odor got so bad they'd have to set up fans just to stir the air. But people were more interested in moving on with the Lord. And and oil would appear in their hands. And a, a, a water would appear in their hands. And they all they knew to call it was latter rain. It was a rain of the spirit. Guess what the Pentecostals may not say? Now we're down to my day. I went to a Pentecostal church in Southern Missouri, and Linda went to a lot of rain church. And they would tell from the pulpit, don't go over there to the campgrounds, Latter Rain campgrounds. That's taboo. But the Latter Rain began to see, see something more than just speaking in tongues. They began to embrace prophecy and the song of the Lord and and the uh, Davidic worship, and just instead of saying, thank you, Jesus, praise the Lord, and sit down, they begin to say, thank you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I give you glory and honor, Lord. Now, my church didn't like that. So my church became the persecutor. They became the persecutor. In the 1960s, the great charismatic movement began to spread across the land. People didn't like it, but it, it got in their families anyway. It just got in their families. Pentecost did the same thing. The Methodism got is the same way. But everybody that stayed there built a, a monument. And they had a, a, a statement of faith for their church and so forth. What I'm getting at is... is if you don't move on, you become a monument. And then the cares, and, and we have a move today. God is keep bringing us forward, and the charismatics don't know what to do with it. And if it's different than the charismatics, then we're heretics, right? With that, all that in mind, I want us to go to Luke chapter four, and uh, oh, we need somebody. Shannon, can you do the computer today? Try that. I forgot. Duncan's in the team class. Luke chapter 4. Anybody got your Bible today? I challenge you to bring it. Don't just trust the screen, okay? <laughs> All right. Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 says, And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, 
And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And here's where he, where he went, what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to do what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now I'm gonna I'm just gonna make this up. But I'm gonna say when Jesus said He's anointed me to preach the acceptable Lord, I just imagine in my mind that those Jews probably said, Amen. But I don't know if they did or not. But I could imagine they'd be very agreeable. First, uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. There we go. And verse 18. All right. I, I would imagine they'd be very agreeable when Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and He's anointed me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. They had to agree with that because to a Jew... The acceptable year of the Lord was the year of Jubilee. Which meant, and I did a little research on this, all the people that lost their property got their property back. And, and they even found one place where, where a person lost their property and they began to work for somebody else. These people had to set them back up in business. Why wouldn't they want to say, Amen? The Lord, Jesus said, the Lord has anointed me to preach this acceptable year of the Lord. But I want us to go back to Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, where he read, and I want to show you something. He left something out in the New Testament. Isaiah 61, Shannon. Probably get there before I do. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Here's what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening up prisons to them that are bound, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, and to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn it in Zion, to give them the beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Have you got that up there? Mm -hmm. All right, you're right with me. All right. Back up there to about verse 2. Shanna, thank you. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and what? Day of the day of vengeance of our God. Now, go back to Luke 4. Luke chapter 4. There's a little remote left there, Shanna. Would you, to this man that says front, turn that on low. It blows my paper. My page is over. I want to show you something in Luke 4. Something he left out. It's very crucial that we see this. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, and it's verse 18, He hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and to recover the sight of the blind, set at liberty them that are bruised, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What did he leave out? Vengeance. vengeance. The vengeance of our God. He left that out in the New Testament. Isn't that amazing? But he did say, The Lord's anointed me to preach. The acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, verse 21, This day, here's my point, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Now, for sake of time, I'm already hungry, and I know you are too. We're going to have fish fries, so I'm, to, I'm tasting it already. Uh, for second time, jump down to verse 28. And all they that were in the synagogue, when they heard these sayings, were filled with what? Wrath. Wrath. And rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. Why 
was they all for him preaching the acceptable year of the Lord, but now they're ready to kill him. What's the difference? They wanted vengeance, but something else. There's something else. There's a point here. You're right. He's, he was saying he's the Messiah. But when Jesus said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears, my point is, we're not too far removed from that. Jesus is saying to them, it's not a day any longer. It's not a year any longer. I'm your jubilee. Now they're ready to kill him. Because they're looking forward to that 50th year that we can go free. And they didn't realize that Jesus said, y'all free. Y'all free. But when they said, when Jesus said, this day is a scripture fulfilled in the earth, they're ready to kill him. Today, we're trying to say as often as we know how to say. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Do we either believe that or we don't? But somewhere from our forefathers back, just like the Jews was looking for that day, somewhere we've been taught we're so hell-bent that we want somebody to go to hell. Are you with me? I'm just going slow here. Yeah. <laughs> we got to reserve hell for those people we don't like. But Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives and set those people free. He's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He's a, he, he has anointed me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering the sight of the blind. And it's not just the physical blind. There's people who can see perfectly, got 20-20 vision, but they have no insight into the things of God. They have no insight. It's just like they're, they're blundering along here. I call it like a blind dog in a meat house. You know it's there, you just can't find it. They just, you know, we've been, our forefathers have instructed us so much. If we dare step out of the box, we're a heretic. If we dare say something different than what our forefathers taught us, we're a candidate for the left foot of fellowship. They were excited about the day of Jubilee. Jesus said, I'm here to preach that, but I want you to know it's not a year any longer. This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I come to understand the Holy Land is not necessarily a piece of real estate in Israel. Right here is the Holy Land. Right here is the Holy Land. Right here is the Holy Land. The temple... It's no longer something on a hill in Jerusalem. Here's the temple of the Holy Ghost. This is where God resides. The Jews could not hardly handle that. You got a question? Okay. Not necessarily people who are scared to step outside the box. To be the environment they grew up in. Absolutely. And also... This uh, spoke out to me because in the opening of the prison to them that are bound, um, people could be mentally bound in the head. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So they could lead them to worse places like that. Right. Yeah. And people are not only bound mentally, some are so bound spiritually. Mm -hmm. They may be very uh, smart intellectually they may have a high IQ you know I think sometimes us ministers we spend so much time and time to trying to um, take step one step two to, to tell people and teach people how to believe it's got to be a thing of the spirit it's got to be a revelation by the Lord and that's why worship is so important it's uh, uh, 
you know, I've been listening to a guy on on, on the internet. It's uh, Bishop Ash, and he's has anybody heard of him? Marvin got me hooked on him. He said he, he was in a mega church, and they said, "Now we're ready for the most important important part of the service." And he said, "I said, I want to correct you. Preaching is not the most important part. Worship is the most important part." He said, preaching is for people to be changed and lives changed and converted. But whether you need that or not, everybody's got to worship. Everybody needs to worship. So worship is the most important element in their service. If we never worship, we never receive a revelation. Nothing's revealed to us. And, and, and you understand, Jesus is talking to Jews that are steeped in Judaism and steeped in the law. And he says, the Spirit of the Lord anointed me to preach the, the gospel to the poor. Because the Pharisees had such strict rules on so much people, on, on the people, it kept them poor. He said, I've got a new word for you folks. Amen. To you those that are bound, I'm, the Lord's anointed me to preach healing to the brokenhearted. Some of you have never pulled out of it. And some of you today may have been brokenhearted. From your past. You know, Sister Stan, I've told her story a lot of times. Uh, Sister Sned is sitting back on the back row. Was born, and her mother put her in a in a dresser drawer for her to die. Who was it coming got you out of that? Your sister? Her father. Yet most people in this church don't even know she had written a Sunday school curriculum that a lot of churches are using around over America. As a matter of fact, we ordered that, a set of that this week. And uh, I told them, I said, order it from that organization to keep it alive. I want them to see there's more interest in just their little group of churches. And Linda just had to tell them. <laughs> she goes to our church. <laughs> so that curriculum is on order coming to us for every student that never teaches back there. Wonderful curriculum. Yeah, amen. So Sister Sned, God has reserved you for these days. Amen. Amen. Don't even think about checking out. So amen. sorry, Tim. You got to put up with it. <laughs> <coughs> Jesus is Lord. The Spirit, <coughs> where the Lord has anointed, Jesus said, He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. But now they're ready to kill Him because He said, This day is the scripture fulfilled in, in your ears. See, we just still got people that's, that's you know, I went to Israel and uh, I enjoyed it. And a lot of the people I, I went with, or they would stand there and they would cry, and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't stand and look over a banister where they dug down 47 feet down there where Jesus walked, and they just, here's this prayer. And I said, listen, this is the Holy Land now. I mean, I enjoyed my visit, don't get me wrong. I, I'd like to go back. But that didn't, that didn't uh, move me. Because I had had a revelation in worship that God lives here. He lives right in here. I'm the temple now. It's not the Dome of the Rock. It's not this place. It's not sometime they're going to build a temple. That might all happen. I don't know. But my most important thing to me is He lives in me. He lives in me. Praise God. So I understand that when Jesus said, This day is the scripture fulfilled in yours. I'm your Jubilee now. That was hard for him. Now they're ready to kill him. Turn to John chapter 11. And then we'll close with this, but take me a little while to close. John chapter 11. A certain man, verse 1. A certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. It was Mary which anointed the Lord with an ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. His brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, we whom thou lovest is sick. 
He whom thou lovest is sick. And when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of Man, Son of God, may be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when he had heard therefore, when he had heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days, still in the same place where he was. Then after that, saith he to his disciples, Let's go to, Ju to Judea again. And his disciples said to him, Master, the Jews of lately, they sought to stone thee. And you want to go there again? <laughs> Verse 9, Jesus said, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not. Now he's talking spiritually here. And they probably didn't understand that. Because he's at seeth the light, because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in dark, if a man walk in night, he stumbleth, because there's no light in him. These things said he after that he saith unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that he may wake out of his sleep. Then the disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, yeah, he do good, you know. Verse 14, he said, Jesus said unto him plainly, Lazarus is dead. I understand that. Oh, let me add this. Most of the places in the New Testament where it talks about sleeping, It's not talking about that. Just remember that. Am I, he said, am I glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent you may believe? Nevertheless, let's go unto him. Then said Thomas, and, which is called Didymus, and his fellow disciples, let's go that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had laid him in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was was nigh to Jerusalem, about two miles, 15 furlongs, so that's about two miles away. And many, of this, and many of the Jews came to Mary, and to Martha and Mary, and to comfort them according concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary stayed still in the house. Then said Martha unto the Lord, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now whatsoever Thou will ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus said to her, Thy brother shall rise again. Now I'm getting to my point. Martha said to him, I know that he shall rise again. When? In the resurrection at the last day. Again, Jesus stumped. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection. And the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he what? Live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If he'd have been in the pulpit, he might have leaned over like this and said, Can you really believe that? You know when you see so that when your daddy checked out, he just changed his address. I believe as well as I'm standing here. He's not in the grave. His old house is. But I believe he's alive more today than ever before. And sometimes when you get a warm fuzzy and you just feel good that day, might be because daddy's presence was there. I know this is not preached everywhere. But Another reason why I get that at is the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection and that's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, they, they questioned Jesus and they said, well, we'll give you a question here. Let's say that uh, Harlan's married to Jamie and Jamie dies and so she marries his brother. And he dies, and she marries another brother. And he dies, and she marries another brother. And he dies. See, you know, this hypothetical situation question is never going to happen anyway. They suggest, whose would she be in the resurrection? Because they didn't believe resurrection. And Jesus answered them this. He said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm not the God of the dead. I'm the God of the living. What did that say? Those fellows were alive. You know, at the resurrection, when they put Jesus in the tomb, 
something spiritually was taking place. The Bible says he went and preached to the people in prison. Peter comes along in the New Testament and said he preached to all of those in Noah's day. Now who, was, who died in Noah's day? All those in the flood. And Jesus went and preached to them? He had a mission. If Jesus preached to all those in the flood, I believe he's still anointed. I believe his sermon did something. And as just as we had this uh, illustrated sermon a few weeks ago with the door, and we had Brian to come up here and paint both sides of the door and over the top of the door, who was, who was not here for that service? Okay. We had him to, to paint red paint on each side of the door and over the top of the door. And we, we come to understand many hundreds of years later, well, first of all, when they put the blood over the door, the Egyptian, the, the, the Israelites left Egypt. That blood, that was, as we painted, we used to use red paint, but it was the blood of, a, of an animal that they put over their door. My point was, why did they put it on both sides of the door? Because it's hundreds of years later, in, in John's Gospel, Jesus said, I am the door. Why would it be on both sides of Christ? When Jesus died, the blood was on both sides of Christ. It just keeps flowing today. The vilest sinner, Jerry, today can be blessed and saved by the blood of Jesus. But it was on both sides of Christ, so it had to go all the way back to Adam, too. God's plan is so big when he created human beings to love and fellowship with he didn't leave anybody out i do not as much as i used to i'm getting better susan <laughs> I'm get, i got a susan a susan right here <laughs> i'm getting better about accepting the fact that god loves that guy i don't like so i start looking george i start looking for a way to see if I can become a friend with this guy that I don't like, and I try to find things that we have in common, because I choose not to be offended. I choose not to let them offend me. I choose not to do that, because I know God lives in me. And Jerry, we believe in the law of impartation. I was thinking, you know, just thinking uh, uh, two weeks ago about you ministering to that little baby. The Lord gave you his name, her name, and he got to touch her. I like to just touch people and just impart. You know, I don't have to read them a scripture. I don't have to stick a track in their pocket. I don't have to cause them to kneel and pray. So he said, I told the church here a while back, I just say, their nails are pretty. And yours are. And you know what? When a cashier's ringing me out and I say, your nails are pretty, who did that? And you know what they do? They stick their hand out just like that and I touch it. I go out, go out and get my truck and leave and I, you know, I say in my heart, you know, they don't know I'm the tabernacle of God. You're the tabernacle of God. God just does her. I'm not saying I'm God. I'm just saying he lives in me. You know, the old, old Southern Gospel song says, Oh, to be his hands extended. You're his hands. You're his feet. God touched Christy that day because you touched him. Amen. And, you know, it, it's a spiritual thing and people, a lot of people still don't understand that. So they've got, you got everybody going to hell in the hand basket and whatever that means. You know, and, you know, let's just start loving folks. Let's just start loving folks and realize that's what God is, the very essence of God. The Spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus to preach Deliver us from the captive. The Spirit of the Lord is on Micah. Not just to play the drums. But the Spirit of the Lord is on Micah. Wherever he goes, he's an extension of God. Because Christ lives in him. Hallelujah. Down there at Kenworth, you've got a mechanic over there turning wrenches. But you know everything he speaks in the anointed of the Holy Ghost. Jerry Lloyd laying floors over in Kansas. They don't realize that's God laying floors down there. What was it, Jerry? Some guy coming. You were saying you didn't know he's around. Come in. You know, you just, you just, 
makes a difference. Yeah, I said, Jerry just began to minister to him. You know, sometimes the Lord opens the doors where you can talk. I just, I, I just uh, let the Lord grease the hinges. You know, just love folks. Tell them you got a good hairdo and you look nice. I just try to look for things to, to compliment people. You know, we all go through so much negative stuff. Everybody's got a gripe about something. Amen? Amen. It should be a breath of fresh air to meet somebody that says something good. Yep. You know, be like Jesus. Just, you know, everywhere he went, he just said, you know, the kingdom of God's like that seed there. The kingdom of God's like that God fishing. He just, the kingdom of God's like everything he's seen, you know. And you know what got me when he, he came to Matthew and all the disciples, he didn't say, now listen, I'd like you fellas to help me in the ministry, but you got to get saved first. Now, I believe in getting saved, don't get me wrong. But he said, come follow me. Oh, I wish you'd have said, man, just think about it and get saved. Give your heart to the Lord. That would make me feel better. Made my doctrine feel better, you know. <laughs> just come follow me. <laughs> Something about being in the presence of God, it changed their whole attitude. <laughs> I mean, here's some professional fishermen. They just folded up their nets and said, Dad, it's all yours. We're following this guy. Matthew. He was a publican. Publicans are bad folks. Man, they were the 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 uh, the import they charged the people tax. It was the IRS. Where's Alicia? She's an Irish gal. <laughs> they were the IRS, sort of. But they just charged different people. They might have charged Iris one one amount and charged Suzette another amount on the same issue. So everybody hated the publicans. The Romans hired them, but the Romans didn't like them. The Jews didn't like them, but it was a necessary evil. That's how we get money in our country. But also, in our research, we found out the publican, if he didn't have money, they exchanged it for sex. So they were low down, scum of the earth, and we kind of feel like that about the IRS, sort of, you know, sometimes. <coughs> we, don't, we don't feel like that about the, the people that work there, but anyway. Jesus, uh, Zacchaeus is running, the little short guy, he runs down the road, he wants to get the minister of Jesus. And he, Jesus said, come on down. I'm going home with you. I just frosted the, the <laughs> Jews. You know? You don't want to go home with this guy. He's a, he's a chief publican. Chief tax collector. But something about being in the presence of Jesus. He said, you know what? If I've wronged anybody, I'm going to pay it back fourfold. I didn't find anywhere in the scriptures Jesus asked for that. But getting in the presence of God, that's why we try to create an atmosphere of worship here at Joyful Sound Worship Center. So if there's something you need to say, I don't know if this goes on, I just make this up. But in worship, Bob may say, you know, I'm pretty hateful to Tammy last night. And you know, you never want Tammy to say, all right, Bob. <laughs> but when the Holy Ghost deals with you, in worship. And he goes home and while they're driving along he reaches over and gets her by the hand holds her hand. Just him. I apologize. That's being the light of the world. That's the way God wants us to function. No, nothing big and flamboyant. But it fixes something. It fixes something. You know, there's times that Linda and I would just we'd be so mad we'd bite a nail. I'm not knowing the blessing of the brick. But, and she probably did me too a lot of times. But if we just came together in the hall of the house and hugged her and I'd whisper in her ear, I'd say, honey, I'm so sorry. You know, it wouldn't be three minutes 
those kids would be standing and holding our legs and they were little. They didn't know what we said in each other's ear, but it just brought, it brought a stability in our home when they see mom and dad embrace. So if we just do Jesus that way, let me say it another way. The Lord just reprimanded me just now. Jesus was the man. It's the Christ we love now. It's the Christ. It's the Christ that's in us. The Spirit of Christ that's within us. And Jesus said, you know, if you can believe it, I'm the resurrection. It's not a day anymore. It's not, you know, Martha and Mary said, I know the last resurrection, the last day he'll, he'll be raised. No, 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 no. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection. It's not a day anymore. We're still, so many Christians that I know are still looking for some phenomena to come down the road. Listen, Jesus has come. One guy said he comes every day. He comes to Christie through, through Jerry. He comes to your workers through you. Just love everybody. Love God. Understand, Jesus is the resurrection. It's not a day anymore. People, let's get out of that rut. It's not a day anymore. He's, he's ever present. He's ever present. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He is everything. Jesus is everything. He is the resurrection. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. I, I certainly believe in my, in my doctrine. I'm kind of like a lady at Salem. Uh, Terry didn't know Violet Cotner. Violet said, you know, Mike, I go to Christian church, but she said, I have a, I have a religion all of my own. <laughs> so, I guess I got one too. My doctrine is, God loves everybody. He loves everybody. And I'm trying to do my best to get through some of those hard people that, that has such a bad attitude to love them in spite of them attitude. Because Jesus did. He died for them. And I have to come out of that, my despondency and my pr previous tradition and always is looking for Jesus to come somewhere down the road. He's going to come and get us. Hallelujah. In my doctrine, my own religion, I believe Jesus will come back. I really do. But you know, that's not my goal. I just told Linda this week, you know, I said, honey, I finally come to the point that heaven is not my goal anymore. It's a reward. But my goal is to be so conformed to the image of God that everywhere I go, everybody I speak to, if I just say, man, it's nice meeting you, I just imparted God. And I know that somewhere down the road, that person I just shook hands with, God touched them. Again, I just want to really make sure you know, I'm not saying I'm God, I'm not Jesus Christ, but He lives in me. I'm His hands extended. I'm His feet. I'm His heart. <laughs> and there have been times in my life that that I've walked off from people they never had a clue that Jesus is even close by my attitude. But when I say, it's so nice meeting you, I really mean it from my heart. It's not just something that I always say. It's something I mean from my heart. And I know when I leave there, they, somewhere along the line, they'll bow their knee, they'll make Jesus Lord, because God does it. And I wasn't condemning I might have saw 15 things I didn't like about them, but I didn't condemn them. I know Jesus, He's the resurrection. Not somewhere down the line. Jesus is the resurrection. They'll, they'll be resurrected in the Spirit somewhere, somehow, and I don't have to figure it out. I remember a long time ago I heard Kenneth Copeland. I heard him say this 30 years ago. He said, when you preach Jesus, 
and you, and you gave an altar call and it never came, just know this. They heard it. They'll never be the same. They may get it, go somewhere else and bow their knee. They may go somewhere else and somebody water it some more. But you can bet your bottom dollar somewhere down the road they'll give their life to the Lord. And whether you say anything or not, remember the Holy Spirit has been sent to constantly draw people to Christ. The Holy Ghost is doing His job. I just want to hook up with Him and be an extension of that. Hallelujah. Let's say it. Thank you, Father. Help us, Lord, to just realize that you are the resurrection. You are the resurrection. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God.
Father, I just thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Thank you. And her body is receiving and taking on and receiving health that God has promised. Hallelujah. We speak every organ, every tissue, and every fiber of her body will function as God created to. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Praise God. Jesus is alive. Let me say it this way. Christ is alive. Christ is alive.